Hello, my name is Anne-Marie Decker, and I'm an independent researcher focusing primarily on the history and technique of null binding as practiced worldwide. Today I will be presenting, but it looks like, methods for differentiating non-woven loop structures. The correct identification of the structure of any particular artifact and the techniques used to produce it are fundamental to the understanding of its historical context and significance. However, the surface textures of looped fabric cannot always be associated unambiguously with specific techniques, and there can be several ways to produce a particular primary structure. Prior literature has touched on this issue before, but illustrations of distinctive secondary structural attributes and how to recognize them are sparse. I will note that this presentation will be using current terms of art for the techniques. The historical and regional nomenclature for the techniques, which are by no means irrelevant, are unfortunately outside of the scope of this presentation. This presentation will compare the surface structure of fabric produced by cross-knit null binding with that produced by twisted stitch knitting. It will also compare the definitive structure of slip stitch crochet with the same structure speculatively produced as null binding. The diagnostic details include the direction of work as seen in the fabric structure, which can be different between the candidate techniques. The same applies to the increases and decreases, initial and final rows, pickups, joins, transitions between stitch variants, and outright errors. To start, I'd like to draw your attention to this particular sample. The piece is worked right-handed, half in twisted stitch knitting and half in a cross-knit looping variant of null binding. The first important detail is that the structure is crossed knit. Open loop knit structures are produced by the technique of knitting. Knitting uses the needle to hold the stitch open until the next row completes it. Null binding is not dependent on the subsequent row for stability because it is the cross that produces the stability for each stitch. The two techniques are worked in 180 degrees opposite directions from each other to form the same basic cross-knit structure, and thus examinations need to look at the textiles from both angles. Collingwood explicitly normalized his diagrams of looped structures with the loops pointing upwards regardless of working direction. However, this either forces showing the technical back of the null bound structures or the technical front with the typical working direction reversed. Diagrammatic errors can be difficult enough to spot. In this presentation, examples will be shown in the working direction of the particular technique. For the cross-knit structure, the direction of work itself is not a definitive discriminator, but in combination with other factors is at least indicative. Knitting is primarily worked by forming new stitches on the right-hand needle working to the left, and null binding primarily left to right. In this way, null binding is more similar to basketry and netting. There are exceptions, left-handed workers being one possibility, working from the technical back of the fabric another. Null binding can also be worked in a netting fashion from the top to the bottom and left to right, which when read from bottom to top, appears to be a right-to-left spiral. Color changes within an artifact can also be helpful in determining direction of work. Next, we have null binding increases. Because of the opposite methods of creating the structure, a null binding increase has to be compared to a knitting decrease and vice versa. The primary difference is the knitting is a looped lead technique, while null binding is end lead. Thus, in knitting, every decrease will have two strands of a connected loop going through any particular stitch. In null binding, it is possible to have a single strand go through a closed loop. Here, you can see three definitive null binding increases where the strands of the previous row pass through the closed loop while continuing on to form the subsequent stitches in the spiral. They are not looping back at some point. These are somewhat times easier to see from the technical back of the fabric. You can see these types of increases in the stitch patterning of the fragment from Dura Europa, Syria, dating prior to 256 CE, 
of which this is a close-up. While primarily it uses the middle example going back two rows deep, in the pomegranate motif there is one increase going back three rows deep, the one on the left. Now, null binding can also produce increases that cannot be used as definitive markers of the technique. For example, the duplicative increase where the increased stitch connects to the previous row using exactly the same cross connection of the previous stitch. This produces the same structure as a twisted stitch knitting knit two together or slip stitch knit decrease, depending on direction. This increase has also been found in historical examples, such as one of the pairs of socks found in Gebel Abu Feda in Egypt, which was art historically dated to the 5th to 8th century CE. Decreases in null binding can be similarly definitive, the most obvious option being combining two or more stitches where the working strand goes through the closed loop of at least one stitch. Knitting increases from within a stitch require that two strands go through the closed loop for each new stitch. On the top left, I am showing decreasing the left hand whale, and on the bottom left, decreasing the right hand whale. This too shows up in the stitch patterning of the pattern fragment from Dura Europus, as does a non definitive type of decrease shown on the right, where the null binding simply skips a stitch in the previous row entirely. This is equivalent to E cast on make one increase in knitting where a new loop is formed between two stitches. Other areas that can be useful in determining which particular technique was used to produce an artifact is in the pickups and errors. How null binding stabilizes the loop at the end of a row of back and forth construction can vary. Twisted stitch knitting will always have a loop pulled through a loop. Null binding can have a single strand through a closed loop. This can also be seen in how sections connect to a previously worked flat section or how a flat worked section connects to the previously worked body. Errors can also provide definitive clues as to construction technique. Null binding, being an end lead, can catch only part of the connection to the previous row. This tends to leave the crossing strand of the stitch of the previous row now more prominent and was noted as a definitive identifier in Dorothy Burnham's article on the technique published in 1972. Null binding can also split the ply in various places in the process of forming a stitch. Now I'm going to transition to the slip stitch crochet structure. Confusions regarding which technique produced this structure in artifacts have led to the misidentification not only of the technique used, but also the likely dating of some artifacts, as the dating is based on the art historical dating of them being null bound objects. This then complicates and obscures our understanding of the history and usage of both techniques. Slip stitch crochet has four primary structural variants and four inverse or left handed variants that I will not be showing. I will be focusing on the open and crossed front loop only and the open and crossed back loop only variations. What qualifies as a stitch in these particular structures varies by technique. Crochet is a loop led technique where a loop of thread is pulled through the previous row and at least one previous stitch in the current row, slip stitch being pulled through only one stitch in the current row. The theoretical null binding variants that can produce the same basic structure separate the creation of that working loop in crochet by producing part of the loop structure in one null binding stitch and the other part of the subsequent stitch which also produces the first part of the next crochet style loop. The under slash over under and over slash under over null binding stitches create the same structure as crocheted chains yarn over and yarn under. To produce two of the slip stitch variants, the theoretical null binding stitch is worked in the usual fashion with the thread passing from one stitch to the next away from the resultant fabric. In order to be able to attempt to reproduce the other two structures, the null binding stitch has to be worked upside down, with the thread progressing from one stitch to the other directly adjacent to the connection to the previous row. 
This is distinctly atypical of any of the various methods of working null bound stitches is found throughout the world. As with the technique overlap in creating the cross knit structure, the theoretical null binding variants that produce the slip stitch structure are worked in 180 degrees opposite direction. Again, the two techniques are typically worked in opposing spirals, null binding being worked left to right, while crochet is primarily worked right to left. Where the slip stitch techniques overlap differs from the knit overlap is that the direction of work can be a definitive technique indicator for this structure. If the slip stitch structure object shows evidence of being worked in a Z type spiral with the crochet style loops of the edge descending, then it was definitively null bound. However, it is possible for null binding to be worked in its left to right orientation, but from the technical back, which will produce a spiral in the standard S type spiral of slip stitch crochet. When that's the case, the resultant null bound structure is froggable from the start with a minor movement of one strand. Thus, the S type spiral is not a definitive indicator. In null binding's typical Z spiral direction of work, it cannot be frogged as the crochet style loops produced are facing the opposite direction. They're descending the spiral, not ascending it. Slip stitch crochet objects often use more than one variation in the same object, back loop only and front loop only. Multiple variants of null binding in the same object does occur, but with much less frequency in most regions. Of particular importance to the purpose of definitively identifying which technique was used to make the slip stitch structure of a particular artifact is the fact that it is very easy for a practitioner of crochet to switch between the front loop only and back loop only structures and between yarn over S wraps and yarn under Z wraps because the theoretical null binding variants that can reproduce those various structures form part of the crochet structure at a time Switching between variations produces a difference in structure at the point of change. Such switching is accomplished by changing the connection to the previous row with or without changing the orientation of the progression between stitches in relation to the previous work. Null bound increases are capable of reproducing a variety of structures, but most commonly are produced by connecting the increased stitch into the previous row by connecting into the same location as the previous stitch. Crochet increases are produced by making an additional stitch in the same stitch loop of the previous row, but generally by taking a different connection stitch, back loop only and front loop only, or vice versa. Otherwise, it's just a chain stitch in the air between. Nonetheless, no matter how crochet produces the increase, it is always by pulling an additional loop through a loop. There will always be both legs of the loop pulled through another loop. Null binding, being end-led, can reproduce a crochet style increase. However, the particular interlacing necessary to get both halves of the crochet style loop portion of the structure to occur requires specific and non-intuitive manipulations of the needle and thread. The methods of doing so have been diagrammed in previous publications that erroneously classified crochet artifacts as null bound and then worked out how to produce the structure as seen in that artifact, which is quite impressive, but problematic. Decreases have similar differences. A crochet decrease will always be performed by pulling both legs of a loop through the loops. A null binding decrease will pull a single strand through, creating one half of the crochet style loop in one stitch and the other half with the subsequent null binding stitch. The more intuitive and standard styles of null binding decreases will result in single strands being pulled through closed loops and not producing the loop structure of slip stitch crochet in that particular location. The null binding technique is prone to a particular type of error that cannot be formed by the crochet technique, that is, only partially completing the connection to the previous row. This will result in a single strand going through a loop and an incomplete duplication of the crochet style loop structure. Another error that can be apparent in both techniques but differs in execution and resulting structure and surface texture detail is splitting the ply or the strands of the thread. In crochet, the split occurs when pulling both legs of a loop through the same split in the yarn. 
as null binding creates that crochet style loop structure partially in one stitch and part in the other, the likelihood of splitting the strand in exactly the same place with both stitches is unlikely. More likely is one half splitting the thread, resulting in a single strand through a closed space. So far, all of the artifacts previously identified as having been worked in the theoretical slip stitch null binding have proven to have definitive markers indicating they were crocheted. Splitting the ply is one of those markers. Another very common misidentification of technique is represented in this type of shawl. As I mentioned before, there are two null binding variants that create the same structure as crocheted chains. The connections between these chains reveal that this shawl was crocheted, not null bound, as you can see where the loop was pulled through the loops and not end led as would be seen in a null bound fabric. Wear and finishing techniques can distort these structures, so it is important to understand how they work and how they move. Even in cases where there is not a direct structural overlap between techniques, the surface texture of the resultant fabric can result in misidentification. So besides familiarizing oneself with as many techniques as possible, it can be helpful to recognize certain common visual confusions. Some such are intentional, such as the herringbone knitting stitch and the crochet faux null binding. Others are the result of the fact that compound null binding variants tend to produce surface textures that are of a twill or herringbone appearance. Depending on the particular number of interconnections and the corresponding connection to the previous row, the angle at which the threads cross can approach 90 degrees. While this twill appearance will be around 45 degrees off from a woven twill surface texture, if the artifact in question is a fragment with no obvious orientation, visual confusion is understandable. It is helpful to photograph fragments with the identified structures in the orientation appropriate to that structure to avoid visual confusion. Roughened surfaces can obscure the more identifying characteristics of the slightly overlapping whale and the odd number of reversals. Another surface texture confusion we see is that of spraying and the doubly interlaced hourglass variants of null binding. The surface texture for both can have that chain link fence appearance. However, null binding will have horizontal connections between the rows instead of the interlacing continuing vertically throughout the artifact. Loop structures occur across the world and throughout time. Which technique varies by where and when, but there are areas of overlap. This is an as of yet incomplete map, primarily of extant null bound finds throughout time. What knit and crochet artifacts are reflected on it are there due to a prior misidentification as null bound. It reflects clearly the biases in available research and how much more there is to learn. As we classify the details of null bound artifacts, more trends will become noticeable. I hope this presentation provided you with the ability to recognize some of the secondary structural differences that can help differentiate between looping techniques. Better analysis of both the structure and the techniques used in historical artifacts will go a long way towards increasing our understanding of the history, usage, and distribution of these techniques throughout the world. I've included a link to my blog where I will be adding additional content on this subject to include short videos of the various techniques and definitive structural details. I can be reached at annemariedecker at nullbound.com if you are interested in continuing this discussion.